The, uh, the subject is a very interesting one, isn't it? I mean, we, we live in a society where we find a great deal of different kind of people. Uh, some people are kind, some people are law-abiding, and some people are not so good. Some people are a mixture of good and bad. Others are straight evil. Uh, some are peaceful, some are warlike. You know, the human experience tells us that we have a vast range of what we would call good morals or bad morals. And uh, tonight we want to explore really the question whether innately we are good. And we need to explore really what the Bible has to say about this significant subject. I don't know whether you know much about Christadelphians. Uh, the name Christadelphia means brother or sister in Christ. Uh, we are a worldwide group of Bible students who believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. So both Old Testament and New Testament given by God, and it's the authority, the only authority that we can appeal to in matters of religion and of truth. It's not what I say or what you say, it's what the Word of God says. And therefore, we'll be appealing to the Bible this evening for some of the points we wish to make this evening. Are we naturally good people? Well, sadly, the answer is no. I'd like you to come to Jeremiah chapter 17. If ever we have a verse that sums up mankind's problem, Jeremiah 17 gives us that thought. So in verse 9 of Jeremiah 17, we read these words. The heart, the thinking, the emotions, if you like, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now let's, let's just analyze this verse for a moment. Deceitful. Now, now what does that mean? Well, what deceitful means that you say one thing and mean another, or you portray one thing and you do something different. You have been deceived. And what the word of God is saying is, is that above everything else, everything you can think of that's deceitful, the heart is the worst, the mind is the worst. Above all things, that's quite a statement when you think about that. And then it says, and is desperately wicked. And if we are reading the original Hebrew, because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, New Testament was written in Greek, that word wicked actually means sick. It is desperately sick. And you know, when there's sickness around, that it needs to be healed. Now that's quite a condemnatory kind of verse, isn't it? Everything you can think of that's deceitful, the mind and the heart and the disposition is the worst you can think of above all things. And there is a sickness, which is the condition of human nature that makes it desperately wicked. And, and this thought is going to go consistently through the scriptures themselves. Let's take Mark chapter 7, for example. Let's, let's have a look at this in Mark chapter 7. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, in Mark chapter 7, was questioned by the religious rulers of the day. They're called the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, these particular individuals placed a great store on a very formal, external kind of religion. It really was a mask, as, as the Lord Jesus Christ actually exposes. But you see, in verse 3 of Mark chapter 7, they, they noticed that the disciples were eating without washing their hands. So in verse 3, we read, The Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands often, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. Many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. So, so their religion was very, very external. Washing was an important ritual they had. and I mean, hygienically, it makes sense, but they put a religious connotation on that. And if you didn't wash before you ate, then you were condemned by God. That's how they saw those commandments. Now, Jesus is going to expose this, and he's going to demonstrate what truly defiles, what truly makes a person unclean, and it goes beyond the physical. That's where the Pharisees had their emphasis. 
In fact, he condemned them by saying, well, you've introduced traditions which nullify the very intent of the word of God, and you hold your traditions more important than the word of God itself. So he denounced them. And now he comes to the position, what truly makes a person unclean? What defiles them in the ultimate moral sense? And so in verse 14 of this chapter, when he had called all the people unto him, he said to them, hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. So this is, this is a significant statement. All the people, listen, every one of you, and understand. So there's, there's a principle he's going to enumerate. Verse 15, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. That's all he said. What comes out of a man defiles him. And the disciples were puzzled by that. What exactly do they mean by that? So in verse 17, when he was entered into the house for the people, his disciples asked him concerning this parable. And he said to them, verse 18, are you so without understanding also? Do not perceive that whatsoever thing from without enters into the man, it cannot defile him. It enters not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. He said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For, verse 21, from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. And there the Lord puts his finger <coughs> on the problem. The heart of man is deceitful above all things. Man is defiled morally by all of these thoughts that are generated by the mind. And, and I'm sure from everyone's experience here, we know that random thoughts just appear in the mind on all sorts of subjects, some good, mostly bad. And all of these things, adulteries, the fornication, the thefts and murders, they emerge from the heart, the thoughts of mankind. And sadly, that really is the condition of man. Are we naturally good people? Sadly, we are not. Now, in Mark chapter 10, the Lord is going to underscore the answer to the question for this evening. Mark chapter 10. In verse 17, when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So he's an earnest young man, genuinely interested in the answer to that question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And it's a bit of a, a mixed question, but we'll leave that aside. But he addressed the Lord as good master, now, when you think about this, the Lord Jesus Christ was the only man, the Son of God, who was absolutely sinless. And if ever you could put a label on the Lord Jesus Christ, it would be good. Good master, the young man said. What was the Lord's response? Verse 18. Jesus said to him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. And the Lord Jesus Christ came with the same nature that we have, the same inclinations that we have. He overcame them. He was sinless. But when someone addressed him as good master, he immediately deflected that by saying, there is none good except God only. Are we naturally good people? The Lord said, no, we're not. We're not. We have an inclination, a real problem. From the heart come unwanted and evil thoughts. And that gives us this tremendous sense of not being good people. Now, how did all this start? How did all this start? Let's come back to Genesis chapter 2. As Christadelphians, we believe that the Genesis record is a literal record 
and particularly the first chapters of Genesis are crucial chapters to understand the creation of God and also to understand how the problem that we've got, this deceitful heart, came into being. God created in six days, and on the sixth day, he created man and woman, and he placed man and woman in the garden to look after the garden. And then in chapter 2 of Genesis, God gave a law, verse 16 of Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, this is a significant verse. Firstly, man being created was created very good. We know that from Genesis 1 and verse 31. Everything that God created was very good. Why was the law given to this man and woman? Well, God is going to create an environment which man and woman work in, and he's also going to put them under a law to test their obedience. There is nothing in the nature of Adam and Eve that rebelled against that commandment. In fact, when Adam repeated the commandment to Eve, and Eve also vocalized that command, there was nothing within their nature that wanted to do anything else but obey God. The other point is this. If you eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that means that you disobey my will, thou shalt surely die. So death is not yet in the world. Uh, but there is a clear connotation being given here that obedience gives life and disobedience thou shalt surely die. Well, in Genesis chapter 3, we have the introduction of sin into the world. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, we have a serpent introduced who was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. It was an animal. And being an animal, it, it it was neither moral nor immoral, it was just an animal, and the expressions and thoughts that it gave, it could actually vocalize those. Now, we believe that this record is literal. And the serpent approached the woman and suggested, in fact, that God was not truthful. God says, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And the serpent turned round and said to her, you will not die. In fact, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like the angels around you. And clearly, in animal thinking, if your eyes are open, you're not dead. And sadly, that sophistry, that uh, suggestion that God, in fact, was not truthful, entered into the mind of Eve and that awakened desires which were unlawful. She then convinced Adam to eat the fruit with her and both transgressed. And from that time onwards, man's nature changed dramatically. Prior to this, they were both naked, but there was no embarrassment or shame. Prior to this, they were in harmony with God. But once they had transgressed and those Unlawful desires had been awakened. It became a law in their nature. And from that point onwards, man and woman became mortal and man and woman became inclined to do and to think evil. It's a tragic story, isn't it? A tragic story. And tragically, as they had children and grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, all of the effects of their transgression, this inclination to think the wrong thing and to actually be mortal and die was passed across through generations. Now, if you come to Romans chapter 5, uh, the Apostle Paul summarizes that sad reality. Romans chapter 5. The blame lies squarely on Adam and Eve. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man... Sin entered into the world, 
and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Let's just pull this verse apart because it's a critical verse. How did sin enter the world by one man? God was not responsible for sin. Man was responsible for introducing sin into the world, point number one. Death was not present before that transgression. Death comes by sin. In other words, you sin, you shall surely die. The wages of sin is death, said Paul later on in Romans. And death passed upon all men. So Adam's son and his grandson, his great-grandson, they are born into a framework of death. Now, is God just doing that? I mean, it's Adam and Eve that transgressed. So, so why, therefore, should the death penalty be passed across all mankind? Because at the end of verse 12, all have sinned. And what Paul is saying is this, that the transgression of Adam and, Lee, Adam and Eve unloosed an inclination to do evil and to think evil that was so strong that it was inevitable that the rest of humanity would sin and therefore God was perfectly just in condemning the whole race to death. You see that? Death passed upon all men because all have sinned. And that inevitability of sinning, God understood that and therefore was perfectly just in allowing mortality to reign to the human race. And that's the condition that we find ourselves in, a tragic situation. So Romans chapter 6, the last verse of Romans chapter 6, the wages of sin is death. We sin and therefore we deserve to die. And sadly, that is our position. Now let's explore this a little bit more. The unlawful desires which were awakened in Adam and Eve, which became a, a fixture of their nature, sadly goes through all mankind. We inherit that same nature. We are prone to sin, we are inclined to think and do the wrong thing, and we're going to die. Now in Romans chapter 7, Paul delves into this arrangement a little more carefully. Now let's, let's, let's paint a background picture. Paul was a Jew, and by birth he was born into the Jewish race. He was educated in a Jewish framework. In fact, he was a very strict Pharisee. Pharisees did all they possibly could to take God's law and to keep every part of that law. And it could be possible that you could be blameless under that law. For example, I, if I keep the Sabbath, tick that little box. If I uh, keep a burnt offering, I can tick that box. If I uh, make sure I wash before a meal, I tick that box. And all of these rules, which were set out by the Jewish religious system, Paul kept perfectly until the day came when the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him and changed his whole world view. But Paul is now going to describe in Romans chapter 7 how sin works. And it's really quite, quite a fascinating, uh, if you like, introspection of Paul's life. Now, in verse 5 of Romans 7, he says this, When we were in the flesh, the motions of sin or the passions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. What's that verse saying? Well, he's living a life. And he talks about the motions or the passions of sins. In other words, our desires. And he says these desires are by the law working in our members. Now, what on earth does that mean? Well, he's going to talk about the effect that the law of Moses had on his life. In verse 7, what should we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, or by no means. No, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law has said, thou shalt not covet. So the law itself was an education, 
a schoolmaster, if you like. And what the law of Moses did, it said this is right and that's wrong. And Paul says it, it was good. It, it, it educated me. God told me what was right and what was wrong. I, I would not have understood what covetousness was unless the law had said thou shalt not covet. But, but he found a problem. See, when the law said thou shalt not covet, it, it was actually underscoring an emotion, a thought, a feeling. And as soon as the law said, thou shalt not covet, he found that there was a response in his nature that wanted to covet. So verse 8, sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. Concupiscence is an old-fashioned word, extreme lust. It's like talking to your children. You say, don't touch, and the child will want to do the touching. That's part of our nature. And, and that's what Paul found. It was, it was relatively easy to keep the law washing and sacrifices and Sabbath days. But see, as soon as the law said, don't covet, and it points to an emotion and an intellectual exercise, Paul found this response in his nature. And sin, or the motions of sins, Sprung to life. And that's the problem we all face. When people say don't, one of our immediate reactions is to actually do the opposite. So, verse 10, the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. My reaction to that in which covetousness came to the fore, in the end won out. That's how strong this inclination to do evil, to think evil is. And, and the law that was good, that was designed to teach me not to covet, I found the source of death because it engendered within me a reaction. And that's the problem we have. Verse 13. What was then that which is good made death unto me? By no means. But sin, that's the motions of sins, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So the law was given not just to educate, but to demonstrate, to demonstrate the innate sinfulness of human nature. Now, he, he changes the figure a little bit in verse 14. The law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold unto sin. So, so he, he likens himself to be a slave, sold unto sin. And now he explains the struggle that occurred within him. Verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. He wanted to do the right thing but found himself incapable of doing that. He, he hated not doing the right thing, and he ended up doing it. That's the struggle he had. Verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I consent to the law, it's good. I, I, I agree that I shouldn't be doing those things, he said. But then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And sin, he's talking about the motions of sin, the, the unlawful desires which are ranging in his body. For I know, verse 18, that in me, that's in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Are we naturally good people? I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. And that's our problem. It, it is a huge problem that we all face. This natural inclination to think the wrong thing, to be inclined to do the wrong thing, to be inclined to sin. And Paul, for all his righteousness and for all his religious upbringing, still felt that pull because it's in every one of us. Verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. I want to do the right thing, 
but there is within me no good thing. It's different to Adam and Eve before transgression. There was nothing in their nature that wanted to disobey the laws of God, but after transgression, an entirely different thing. Verse 23 Verse 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So, so I love the Bible. I love the word of God. But in verse 23, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. It's a struggle. And Paul felt, found himself losing that battle at times. That's why he said in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? What a good question. If we have this inclination to sin, <coughs> this struggle, and we find the things we want to do right, we can't do it, and the things that we hate to do, we do, we're in Paul's situation. And Paul asked the question, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? What is the solution to that problem? It's all very well highlighting the problem, but what is the solution? Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there is a solution, and it will involve the Lord Jesus Christ at some level. So we need to understand what the solution is. We know the problem. What is the solution? Well, chapter 8 gives us a few clues. We won't have time to deal all with chapter 8. But in chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. Now, now, what does that word mean? Well, if you are condemned, you've done the wrong thing and you deserve punishment. But... There's now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So there are two conditions here. Even though we struggle with, with all these unlawful desires, uh, Paul says there is a solution, and, and it's a solution which has got two aspects. Firstly, you need to be in Christ Jesus. And secondly, you have to have a walk in your life, which Paul calls walking after the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Uh, what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus, and what does it mean to walk after the Spirit? Well, Paul is going to explain a little bit further in chapter 8, isn't he? Uh, for example, he's going to say in verse 6, there's two types of thinking. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The thinking which we have to develop is what's called spiritually mindedness. We naturally have an inclination which Paul calls to be carnally minded. In other words, we do what we think we feel is right. But there's another type of thinking which Paul calls the thinking of the spirit, which is actually regulated by the word of God itself. So let, let's just summarize. We have a struggle. We have thoughts which are inclined to the evil. We're like Paul, wretched people. What's the solution? The solution is you need to be in Jesus Christ and you need to have a different frame of reference, a different type of thinking, a different motivation, something which has got to come outside into your mind to change your thinking from natural thinking to spiritual thinking. Let's deal with the in Christ Jesus last. We'll, we'll talk about how we come into Jesus Christ. Let's deal with the thinking aspect first. What, what influence is going to come into our life that is actually going to change the way we think? Well, let's come across to Psalm 119. It is the word of God. So 
So in Psalm 119 and verse 9, we read this. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? That's a good question, isn't it? How do you clean the mind? How do you wash the mind? How do, how do you change your way of thinking? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. In other words, the word of God has the power and the potential to change the way you think and to clean you. Now, we talked about defiling and uncleanness, didn't we? And we saw the heart generates spontaneous thoughts which are evil. We've got to clean that. And that verse, Psalm 119, verse 9, tells us that we are clean by taking heed according to the word of God. And that means, A, reading it, B, understanding it, C, putting it into practice. Taking heed according to thy word. Now, how does the word of God change one's thinking? Come across to Psalm 19. Now, Psalm 19 is a, is a glorious psalm. It talks about the power and wonder of God's creation. Go out in the evening and see a starry night, and, and we're impressed with the vastness of the universe and the power of Almighty God. But halfway through the psalm, the psalmist gives us another power that we need to think about. Here it is in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. So the Bible that we have, the word of God, is perfect. It's everything that we need in this life. Secondly, in verse 7, it converts the soul. The word soul simply means life. The word of God has the power to convert. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The word simple has the idea of naive. So the word of God is perfect. It's all that we need. Secondly, it can transform you and convert you. Three, it can give you instruction. It can give you wisdom. Verse 8, the statutes of the Lord are right, absolutely right. Rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. As the Lord said in John 17, verse 17, God's word is truth. Now, how does it change us? Well, the word of God gives us different priorities. It gives us a different motivation. It gives us an understanding of the character of God. It gives us an understanding of the work of Jesus Christ. And all of that information, when it's absorbed and regularly digested, and thought about and believed and acted upon, in the end, begin to change the way you think. It doesn't completely get rid of evil thoughts, but it will change your perspective and your priorities, and it can clean and cleanse you. Now, that's a power. That is a great power. Come to 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is the way Paul put it. Second Timothy and chapter 3, verse 15. From a child, and Paul is writing to a young man, Timothy, he was a believer. From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. There, there's that expression, in Christ Jesus. So the first point that Paul makes is, the scriptures are holy, that they've been given by God, they're not just any book, and they can give you a wisdom which can lead to salvation, but you have to believe. It's faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 16, all scriptures given by inspiration of God, it's God breathed, it's his word. 
is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That is power. Bringing the principles and lessons and teachings of the word of God, which are going to change our perspective and it's going to cleanse our mind. Once you walk by faith in things which God has expressed, you don't have the same inclination to get mixed up in evil. You don't want to do those things which you thought you liked doing before. It gives you the perspective of God. And that will slowly and surely over time produce spiritual thinking. It's an amazing thing. Man introduced sin and this inclination to sin. God has given us the solution, the word of God. And that's why we as Christadelphians put a great emphasis upon the word of God. It's the authority of God's truth and has the power to save and to give us wisdom. So what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Remember those two things? There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the Spirit. That's spiritual thinking. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Well, in Mark chapter 16, which I'd like you to turn to, We have a commandment by the Lord Jesus Christ, which involves a number of components for salvation. Now, in Mark 16 and verse 15, Jesus said to the disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. Now, now, there are a number of elements in those verses that we need to think about. It's a universal thing. Not just a Jewish thing, it's universal. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So, so here's an element that we need to understand and define, the gospel. What is the gospel? And secondly, in verse 16, he that believeth, so, so it's reading, understanding and believing the gospel and is baptized shall be saved. So we have some elements here. We have the gospel, we have faith, and we also have baptism. What has this got to do with being in Jesus Christ? Well, in Romans chapter 6, if we come back to that section in Romans, what baptism does is introduce us, us to Jesus Christ. So Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So what baptism does is it takes a person from being outside of Jesus Christ to being in Jesus Christ. We're covered by his righteousness. That's how you become in Jesus Christ. And to be baptized into Jesus Christ, you have to know the gospel and believe the gospel. Now, now what's involved with faith? How, how does faith come into the equation? We'll come to Hebrews chapter 11. You know, we, we have a wonderful definition by the Apostle Paul of, of, of what it means to have faith or to believe. Faith isn't just some airy-fairy kind of feeling. Uh, in Re Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the confident anticipation of things hoped for, the full persuasion of things not seen. No one's here seen God. No one's seen Jesus Christ. But we have a foundation which gives us confidence that we can believe that he exists and also that he's at work in the earth. And that knowledge and information makes us believe. That's what Paul is saying. Faith is the confident anticipation of things hoped for, the full persuasion of things not seen. And it's the word of God 
that gives us that. Come to Romans chapter 10. Faith has a foundation. In Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul said very simply, very clearly, in Romans 10 and verse 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. Reading it, exploring it, understanding it, listening to it, performing it, faith is generated. If God did certain things in the past, that gives us the confidence to believe he was doing things in our life and also in the future. When we come to 1 Corinthians 15, we understand the power of the gospel. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So he's talking about the subject of the gospel. Which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. So the Apostle Paul, his teachings, teach, taught, should I say, the gospel. Verse 2, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now, these believers in Corinth were straying from the gospel. And Paul had to bring them back to the truth of the gospel. And he said in verse 2 that if you can keep it in memory, if you keep it in mind, if you hold fast to that, you will be saved. So you can see the gospel is absolutely critical in this. Absolutely critical. And that's why Jesus Christ said to the the apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And by being baptized, we are in Christ Jesus. But you have to have the right gospel. Unfortunately, the Corinthians were straying from those gospel truths. Paul had to bring them back. You're saved, he said, if you have the gospel in your mind, working in your heart. So what is the gospel? Well, in Acts chapter 8, we have a nice summary of what the gospel is all about. Acts chapter 8 describes the preaching activity of a man called Philip. And Philip went abroad with the apostles preaching. Now in Acts chapter 8 and verse 25, we read this. And they, that is the uh, apostles, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Let's just understand the background of this verse. Israel was divided into two ethnic groups. There were the Jews who lived around Jerusalem and also in Galilee. And right in the center of the land was another ethnic group called the Samaritans. They had a very hybrid kind of religion. Eventually, the gospel truth went into Samaria. And the apostles, as we saw in verse 25, preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. It was quite revolutionary, particularly when Jews and Samaritans traditionally hated each other. So the Bible truth is now going across the border into Samaria, and they're preaching the gospel in all of those villages. Now, in verse 12, we have a definition of that gospel. Verse 12 when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So you put verse 25 next to verse 12. Verse 25, they preached the gospel. Verse 12, they preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They are equivalent. So the gospel is made up of two elements. The things concerning God's kingdom and the work of salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, we have lectures from this platform, as from all Christophian platforms, explaining this a little bit more carefully. So I'm not going to deal with that this evening. Do we believe the things concerning the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? 
How will it be established? When will it be established? Who will establish it? What form will it take? All of those questions we can answer because the Bible gives us the authority to do so. And the other component is the saving work of Jesus Christ. How does his crucifixion save us? How does that work? How are our sins forgiven? And all of those questions come into that second part of the gospel record. Are we naturally good people? Sadly, we are not. We are inclined to evil. However, God has not left us without a solution. And the solution is very simply to be baptized into Jesus Christ, having believed the gospel, and get that word of God in our minds to cleanse us and to change us so that we can think spiritually. To be carnally minded is death, said Paul. Your natural thinking will only lead to death, but if you have developed spiritual mind, that's life and peace. May it be that we may take hold of the gospel, believe what God has said, and eventually be saved. Thank you.